See all those lights down there? Small towns that make the nation. But that's not what I want to talk about. I want to talk about the folks who live here. The folks who shop on Saturday night. Who go to bed every night right after the 11 o'clock newscast. Aggressive as folks anywhere. The type of school Middleton supports is a good example of that. Just as Pop Gregor is a splendid example of the way most Middleton folks think. I'd like to have you know him. In fact, I'd like to have you know him as well as I do. For understanding Pop Gregor will help you to understand something bigger. Daniel S. Gregor is known affectionately as Pop to more than two generations of school children in Middleton. Pop got quite involved last evening in school affairs. In fact, he played a big role. And so did this group of drawings and this chart. School custodian, of course, is a big sounding name. And it labels a big job. That of keeping the school clean and healthful and warm. Pop is proud of his job. And proud of the Middleton school he serves. Well, it seems it all started off like this. On the particular evening in question, the Middleton Elementary and High School had cordially invited everybody to attend a back-to-school party. Back-to-school party, as you probably know, is one of those affairs at which grown-ups, especially parents, are given an opportunity to witness the kind of teaching methods that are current in our modern schools. And Middleton School was doing itself proud that night. There were demonstrations of the new methods of teaching history in our schools, the history of this great land of ours, of its geography, civics, economics, and all the rest that make up the social study, the history of the Great Migration, over routes that have since become numbered automobile highways, and our visions of the future that encompass the world. There were interesting demonstrations by the science classes, showing how students today learn about the basic metals and are introduced to the amazing worlds of plastic, synthetic metals. And demonstrations by the vocational classes, the shops and handicraft rooms, where students gain the knowledge and skill that will help them to earn a living and enjoy a fuller life. The grade school classes made presentations too like this stirring Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. One nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. While the show was going on, Pop was enjoying a quiet rest, happy in the knowledge that his school was making a great showing for herself. He was content to be alone, but not for long. No, this story has other characters. The curtain went up on the first act of the drama when three of Middleton's important businessmen chose this door to come out for a smoke. Now, while these are big men in town, Pop still considers them his boys. He knew them back when they were just kids in the old West Side School. Pop was their father confessor then, and he's mighty proud of them now. This is James Coleman. He's the leading banker in Middleton. Harold Johnson is a retail merchant who sees that Middleton's matrons have styles as chic and smart as their city neighbors. And this is Robert Fraser, who owns and operates the Central Manufacturing Company, our biggest industrial plant. Pop and his boys were soon exchanging memories of their school days, recalling the pranks and the pleasantries that are a part of any normal, healthy school career. And then suddenly, out came Fred Bates. Bates is Middleton's real estate czar. Made a lot of money selling home sites to Middleton citizens. I guess the playwrights or literary folks would call Fred the motivating factor in our little story, or at least the instrument that set all the machinery in motion. Bates had something in his mind. Immediately, he began talking in an excited fashion to James Coleman. 
Pop tried to follow the conversation, but it didn't make much sense to him. It seemed to have something to do with spending money or something. Anyway, Fred was shouting, we've got to do something about this right away. We've got to fight this thing. Well, Pop thought, none of my business. No skin off my nose. But whether he wanted it or not, Pop was drawn into the proceedings. Without saying please or any word of courtesy, Bates practically ordered him to lead the way to the principal's office. Pop agreed, but he wasn't too happy about it. As they left, Coleman suggested to Fraser and Johnson they accompany the group. He said that this was a subject which would interest all of them. They agreed, and the whole party trooped toward the principal's office. Mr. Forsyth is the supervising principal of Middleton School. He had left the party for a few moments and returned to his office to pick up some papers to talk over with the school board. Pop started introductions, but Mr. Forsyth already knew the gentleman. After all, they are among the most prominent men in town. But let's listen in on the group and get the story firsthand. Mr. Fraser, how do you do, sir? Mr. Johnson, nice to see you again. Won't you sit down? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Why don't you stay, Pop? Thanks, I will. Well, gentlemen, are you having a good time at the party? Yes, but frankly, Mr. Forsyth, we'd like to know why the devil the school wants more tax money this year. Here we have a brand new school building, not six years old yet. Why do you have to hold up the taxpayers for more money? I'm very glad to have an opportunity to discuss this problem with you. I can readily understand how anyone who doesn't know the facts of the entire situation might come to conclusions that are not quite correct. Suppose I explain our school problem just the way we see it. First, let's look at some pictures. They may be a bit startling, but they do bring home the fact that schools today must prepare students for a new kind of world, a world much different from the one for which you and I were prepared. Today's students will graduate into a fascinating new world of design, of invention, of strange and wonderful conveniences. All of these will bring new problems of living and earning to the citizens of tomorrow. Air travel, for example, is going to be a much more important factor in our lives in the very near future. Scores of children who are students today are destined to play a major role in this air travel world of the future. And we must help them prepare so they can take advantage of their opportunities. Radio, television, and electronics are opening up great new fields of endeavor and opportunity for thousands of students. Those persons who are trained and qualified to make contributions to these new fields are the ones who will enjoy the rewards that an eager world will pay to those who make possible this progress in modern living. Through new uses of our present metals, through a wider use of plastics, synthetic materials, and lighter metals, we'll have new and different kinds of homes, household conveniences, living conditions. There'll be new and unusual methods of processing, packaging, distributing, and selling merchandise and services. All of these wonderful new modern devices and inventions are going to present to the citizens of tomorrow, students of today, not only new and complex problems of living, but more important, new problems of earning and being able to contribute to the new world. To prepare students for tomorrow's world, the three R's are basic, of course. They're a foundation. But they're preliminary to specialization in a particular branch of a science or other fields of study. Teaching today calls for more than books and homework assignments. It requires specialized equipment for classroom demonstration and actual individual experiment. And, of course, it calls for highly specialized, qualified teachers. Just as you men demand expert training and long experience in the people you employ in your engineering or merchandising divisions, so education demands teachers who are scientifically trained. Naturally, we have to pay more to get and keep the best teachers. You see, gentlemen, 
One of our main objectives is to develop citizens who will have the capacity to produce and consume at a rate in keeping with the high standards of living which we want to maintain in our country. To do this, we must employ the very best in tools and methods. Don't you agree? You've got something there in that capacity to produce and consume idea. Yes, but all this costs money. More school taxes are all very well for people who now have children in school. What about the people whose children are out of school or those who have no children? You've got a good point, Mr. Johnson. But I think perhaps I can answer it to your satisfaction. We've seen the contribution which education makes toward helping the individual prepare to earn a living. Now, let's see the contribution it makes to the community. Let's consider some facts and figures. Here are some facts from the research department of the National Education Association, gathered from all classes of persons in all types of industries and income groups throughout the United States. These figures prove that pupils who attend only eight grades of school and then go to work earn in an average lifespan only $64,000 or a yearly average of $1,400. Students who go through high school earn in a lifespan $88,000, about 50% more than those who attended only eight grades of school, or a yearly average of $2,100. And those students who remain in school through college earn $160,000 during an average lifetime, double the yearly earnings of high school graduates, or three times the annual earnings of those who only finish grade school, or a yearly total of $4,200. And what does this mean? In the first place, it proves that education increases the earning power of the individual. And the earning power of the members of a community has a definite bearing on the prosperity of all members of that community. The income of people in a community is in direct proportion to the educational level of those they serve. Who is it that continually buys the inexpensive, inferior merchandise, whether it be in clothes, furniture, or food? Naturally, it's the persons of low income who must stretch their pennies. Those to whom education has brought increased earning power can afford to purchase the quality merchandise, getting more value for their money and bringing better profits to the retailers. And these people buy more, purchasing not only the quality item, but also all the matching accessories that make up the ensemble. And this condition has always been true. Why, back when cars were few and far between, they were available only to persons in the higher income brackets. Maybe you can remember the kitchen in your grandmother's home. The rain, the ice box. They were household conveniences enjoyed only where there were greater incomes. And it's true today. Such modern appliances as these in homes are indicative of the better incomes. Comfortable, up-to-date conveniences, appliances, and services are in the better homes where education has increased the earning power. But education does even more. It gives a firm cultural background through its classes in design and music, through its art and decoration instruction, giving talents an opportunity to develop. This has two definite results. First, such education increases an individual's yearning power. It builds an appreciation for the artistic, the creative, it's the educated who first call for the new, the better, the improved. And second, as my wife has often pointed out, such training improves an individual's buying ability, helping a person to get maximum value for the money spent. As another contribution, schools render an invaluable service in building the health average of a community. 
through classes in physical education, recreation, and bodily improvement. Further, by directing the energies of youth along constructive lines, education helps develop character. This helps reduce juvenile delinquency. And finally, education helps make democracy work. It teaches students to acquire facts, to think for themselves, and to decide issues by peaceful means and majority rule. In a word, it provides the community with well-informed citizens. And that's very important today. Air travel is brought foreign countries so close to us that our civic responsibilities have increased enormously. Now, when you consider all these benefits that education brings community, I think you'll agree that school taxes are not an assessment. They're a community investment that brings a substantial dollars and cents return. Education's progress in a community should be the selfish desire of every businessman in that community, whether he has children in school at any particular moment or not. The aim should be good schools for every district for the laborer's child, as well as for the employer's child. Does that answer your question, Mr. Johnson? Yes, yes it does. Sure, the people of the community benefit, just as you say. But how about outside interests that are taxed, railroads, and absentee owners of business? How do they benefit? They benefit in this way, Mr. Fraser. Ignorance is a liability wherever it exists. It's a liability to a community, to the state, and to the nation. Back in the days of the Cracker Barrel grocery store, there was little opportunity in the average community for outside interests to make a contribution or to profit. Now that people have been educated to earn more, to desire more, and to consume more and better things, Every community offers opportunity to all those who provide goods and services, local folks as well as non-resident owners. Why, if education didn't create desire for the new and modern conveniences and services, and did not give the individual the earning power to pay for such conveniences and services, there'd be little need for the railroads to ship products into this community. The same rule applies to all other forms of outside service which supply a community. Outside owners will also profit from a community in direct relation to the prosperity of the members of that community. And the prosperity of a community depends largely upon the progressiveness of its educational system. That's why education is the responsibility of the community, of the state, and of the nation. He has a good point, though. Have I answered your question satisfactorily? All except mine. Despite all your arguments, Mr. Forsythe, I haven't changed my opinion. I still say we're spending too much money on education as it is. And now you want more. I say it's wrong, and I'm against it. But don't you see, Mr. Don't Pace? Don't it, Fred. You're just as stubborn now as you were in the old West Side School 25 years ago. Excuse me, Mr. Forsythe, but I can't help it. Fred ain't got no business to talk against school taxes. I'm a working man, but I've seen all the things that education has done for the working man, and I'm for it. Why, your parents all thought the same way. None of them had scads of money, did they? You all got where you are today by your education. In fact, Fred, Education did more for you than it did for any of the others. It built your business. What? That's right. That's what I said. Remember when they built that school out on the west side? It was less than four blocks from your dad's 30-acre farm. Now, I happen to know your dad was having a tough time trying to make that place feed his family. He fought the bond issue for that school tooth and nail. Said the taxes would ruin him. Did they? Sir, your pop quit farming, split up the farm into building lots, and that was the beginning of Bates' real estate business up to... And another thing, Fred, 
This school here is one of your best talking points. When you're making these deals, believe me, you brag plenty about the location and the kind of education kids get here. Why, if anything, you should not only vote for school taxes, you should be the first to ask for improvements. Besides, it's going to happen. Pop said a lot of but he did finally convince Bates. Later, as he recalled his own part in the little drama, he was still amazed at his courage in speaking up before those influential men of this town. Pop remembered the points brought out by Mr. Forsyth of the part played by education in preparing students for the grand new world of the future, of the contribution that education makes to the earning power of the individual, and of the fact that education is an investment that brings a community definite monetary returns. Pop knew he was right in speaking out. Pop knew he had rung the bell. Now he was more convinced than ever before that the money invested in education was certainly one place where dollars make sense. Think of it.